Milton Glaser, premier designer, artist, and acting chairman of the board of directors of the School of Visual Arts, will introduce this year's commencement speaker, Dr. Gerald M. Edelman. Milton? Friends, I was pleased to discover that Dr. Gerald Edelman and I were born within a week of one another in New York City in 1929. I am the elder by a very slight margin. I was enthusiastic to find this out because I hoped that our astrological forecasts were identical. And I, I shared some of his characteristics. Jerry, who was a longtime friend, is the smartest person I ever met. Knowing someone who's won a Nobel Prize is impressive, but winning two Nobel Prizes is absurd. <laughs> but that is only one of his many accomplishments. Perhaps most significantly right now, he's the director of the Neuroscience Institute and president of the Neurosciences Research Foundation and the author of many books, including The Remembered Present, Bright Air, Brilliant Fire, and with Giulio Tononi, A Universe of Consciousness, How Matter Becomes Imagination, and most recently, Wider Than the Sky, The Phenomena Gift of Consciousness. In addition, he's the author of 500 research publications and the recipient of numerous awards and honors. His work on the most interesting subject in history, the brain, has produced a new model of human intelligence and has transformed our understanding of the world. Listen carefully, the ideas move Fast. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Edelman. Thank you, Milton. President Rhodes, members of the board, members of the faculty, graduands, families, relatives, and friends, ladies and gentlemen. This elaborate salutation is often followed on occasions of this kind by words of inspiration, congratulations, and exhortation. I hope you'll take those as all given and accept what I'm about to say. I owe the high privilege of this occasion to an invitation from Milton. And when I entered a demurra and pointed out that I was totally ignorant of this field, I was not able to persuade him. And so here I am with gratitude. <laughs> I did feel a certain guilt, so I went to read art history and art criticism. And I went through Arnheim, Volheim, Gombrich, Sir Herbert Reed, Dutton, et cetera, et cetera, and came away informed, but not satisfied from the standpoint of modern neuroscience. So I thought I would take the hazardous position of discussing how one might connect up what you heard about art to the actual workings of the brain, something that is, of course, still incomplete, but of some significance. Now, it's funny. I must find a pointer which has disappeared. So I'm going to be making gesticulations nonetheless. Uh, what I thought I would do is in fact point out how we might go about explaining the universal issues of art, the universality of artistic creation in human populations and cultures, and also explain the related question of the urge to communicate by painting, by forming, by scratching, by doing whatever you do 
to create. And to do so, I'm going to have to discuss the mind. It is not customary for uh, empirical scientists to talk about the mind, but it is customary amongst philosophers and poets. So on the first illustration here, could I have that please? You will see this wonderful fragment of Marianne Moore, the great American poet. She said, the mind is an enchanting thing, is an enchanted thing like the glaze on a katydid wing, subdivided by sun till the nettings are legion, like Giza King playing Scarlatti. And you notice a little hint of a network in there. We're going to come down to that, as a matter of fact. But in fact, the idea that the mind is not usually approached by empirical scientists goes back to the very beginnings of Western science, to two gentlemen, the first of which is Galileo Galileo on your, on your left, who in fact, in his book, The Assayer, said, I know that without animals there would be no warm and no green, but that's not my concern. In fact, what he was concerned with was inertia. A little later, this gentleman here, Rene Descartes, however, the beginnings of modern philosophy, came up with the idea that there were two domains of human existence. The first, what he called race extensa, extended things which could be examined by physics. And the other, race cogitans, which could not. And thus began the philosophy of dualism, the idea that we have things that are demonstrable, tactile, etc., but other things that are spooky. Well, I am going to tell you I reject this position with great honor to the genius that gave rise to the idea. And indeed, I want to point something out about the issue itself. And that is that the idea of some ultimate reality escapes one, because here you have in front of you two illusions. One which is corrigible, the lady and the vase, which you can shift back and forth. And the other, the one on top of it, which is uh, an illusory contour of Gaetano Canizza. And if any of you do not see an overlying triangle, please get in touch with me after this <laughs> sermon. I, I would like to study your brain. <clears throat> Indeed, if you had a physicist traverse the edge of that presumed triangle, he would not find any energy change. So one has to be very cautious about ascribing reality to all of our efforts. I want to make this point. Because somewhat, I think it was in the early 80s, I received a visit by Andy Warhol. And in a kind of breathy voice, he said to me, Dr. Edelman, may I ask you a question? And I said, certainly. He said, why does science take so long? And I said, well, Mr. Warhol, let me ask you something. When you do a Marilyn Monroe, does it have to be exactly the way she is? He said, oh, no, some of them I don't even do. There's something called a factory, and we run out silk screens, and that's all. I said, well, in science, it has to be just the way she is. He said, that's horrible. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do is turn to a little exercise in the brain. And you'll have to forgive me for some of the technicalities. If you get to the hard parts, hum them. <laughs> now look at the posterior portion of that wrinkle structure we call the cerebral cortex. In the very posterior portion is a functionally segregated area called the visual cortex. I don't have the pointer for some reason. Somebody must have purloined it to point at something else. <laughs> if you look over there, you'll see that if you go beyond that with an electrode to measure the activity of the neurons or nerve cells, you'll come into another area having to do with vision. And then if you move up towards the lateral portion, just behind the eye, you will see the auditory cortex that receives the signals that you're hearing right now. And if you go above that, you'll see the sensory motor cortex, touch and motor activity. In the very front is something that's quite astonishing, and that is the prefrontal lobe which from the hominid evolution went from 400 cubic centimeters to 1,400, at least that much for all of you. And in fact, that area is controlling these. So you mustn't make the mistake of localization and think that all these affinities and capabilities rest only in those segregated areas. 
these are modalities, these areas. They relate to the senses, the sense of vision, of touch and smell, and the coordination at the higher level has to do with, of course, many things, perhaps the most paramount of which is language, which you're hearing now. Now, these are all connected, these areas, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I want to give you a feeling for what we're dealing with. And in this room, it's multiplied by my guess by at least 2,000. You can add that multiplication to the number. These neurons, single cells, of course, quite minute, they are electrochemical structures. They convey electricity from one to the other through connections called synapses. And you see those in that little circle at the bottom there. And uh, I want to give you a feeling for what we're dealing with here. In your cerebral cortex, this wrinkled structure alone, which is by no means the whole of your brain, there are 30 billion neurons and 1 million billion connections. If you count one connection per second, you will just finish counting them 32 million years later. I hope you find that impressive. I certainly <laughs> do. Now, the interesting thing about the brain is it is not a computer. I'll say that again. It is not a computer. Intelligence is not artificial intelligence, I assure you. I can't prove that now, time being at my back. But let's take a look at this that all over the brain, connecting these functionally segregated areas, are reciprocal connections of these neurons, making these synapses, as you see down below, which actually form little maps that can vary dynamically in such a way that no two brains are alike. You can take some solace in this. Whatever you share from this experience in this great school with all its divisions and with its depth, you have this. You are unique. If that's not satisfying, I'm sorry. I can't do much. <laughs> but now, if I look at that, I have to say that my position, as you notice, toward the mind is one of physicalist nature and naturalist. Uh, and so if I, I had to give you a model instead of a computer to have as a metaphor, take this by Le Douanier Rousseau, the primeval forest with setting sun. If you look at this, you'll see there's order. There's also randomness. There's variation. And no two such forests will be alike. That's more an image you should keep in your mind for your brain. Now, having said all of that, I want to say that even though I'm a physicalist and a naturalist, I am not a reductionist. Let me explain. When I was about 40 years old, maybe that's when Milton and I met. I'm not sure. The fact is, I was a reductionist. I believed that everything could be explained, including this graduation, in terms of the collisions of molecules and what we call quantum mechanics. I no longer believe that, and I hope after you hear this talk, you'll see why. But just to give any doubters in the audience a challenge, I'm going to challenge any reductionist in the audience with the following story, with the, uh, with the hope that you will be able to show me how it can be reduced to the collisions of molecules. It appears that in a hot summer evening in New York, a young man felt that his girl was carrying on with someone else. So he went to their poor flat, and she denied everything. He looked under the bed, he looked in the closet, they were screaming at each other. He found himself at the rear window, trembling with rage, when out of the corner of his eye, he saw a chap on the elevator below, wiping his brow and loosening his tie. He flew into a rage, grabbed a refrigerator, smashed it through the window, dropped it on this fellow's head, at which point he dropped dead. The scene switches to heaven, and St. Peter said, you have to say how you died. The first one said, well, I thought I had some hanky-panky going on. She denied it, but when I got to the rear window, I saw this guy. I must have had an adrenaline fit. I lifted a refrigerator that I couldn't ordinarily lift, dropped it on his head, and then I dropped dead, probably of a heart attack. The second fellow said, I don't know, I couldn't afford an air conditioner. So I came home early, had a drink, stepped out on the fire escape, loosened my collar, wiped my brow, and this refrigerator fell on my head. And the third fellow said, I don't know, I was just sitting in this refrigerator, minding my own business. <laughs> there is, ladies and gentlemen, a dimension to our experience that far exceeds even the reductionist urge of science, great as it is. Now, having said all this, let me say something about how the brain works. And